It's lived in local folklore for generations. Get away from the water! I'm like, oh my God. And then it picked its head up and came up. History supports the possibility an unknown creature lurks in Lake Champlain. It's not inconceivable we could have an ocean migrant who got hopelessly lost. There could be links between this monster and real creatures. I believe that something in Lake Champlain echolocates. Science explores the probability, challenging old evidence as others search for proof. The only thing really missing is the body. We're going to be eating here. We're going to be sleeping here. This is the spot to be to search for Champ. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. Lake Champlain, a serene freshwater lake in northern New England that covers more than 400 square miles. It is bordered on the east by New York and the west by Vermont. The lake is a quiet place mainly used by small crafts, ferries, and lake cruises. And perhaps something else. Something that shouldn't be there. The locals call it Champ, America's Loch Ness. And like Scotland's famed Nessie, hundreds claim to have seen it. But what have they seen? On his way to Canada, the French explorer Samuel de Champlain mapped the lake that would eventually bear his name. Back then, this area was lush, remote, and sparsely populated. According to one version of history, in July of 1609, de Champlain became the first person to record seeing a monster here. As the legend goes, he described it this way, a 20-foot serpent as thick as a barrel and a head like a horse. It kind of looked like, you would guess what a submarine would look like. But it moved out, it turned around, and it went out into darkness. It had a girth or, a, or a, a torso about the size of a pony, I would guess. A crocodile shaped like a seal with a long neck. And it came up, and I could now make out part of the head and a little bit of the neck. I would say it was probably a good six to eight feet long. Very smooth skin, no scales, no fur that I could, I could ascertain. And four sets of flippers and a tail. That's what these things look like. I didn't see any dorsal fins or anything. But that was not a fish. That was the, like a dinosaur head. Eyewitnesses today describe the creature as long, sleek, and prehistoric looking. It's estimated to be between 6 and 25 feet in length, possibly humpbacked, with a snake-like head. These descriptions indicate that whatever this monster is, it is unlike any known creature found in freshwater in this part of North America, or anywhere else for that matter. This body of water has a unique geological profile. Less than 11,000 years ago, what is now Lake Champlain was connected directly to the Atlantic. In 1849, two Irish workmen were helping to construct the first railroad between Rutland and Burlington, Vermont. They were digging in this area when they unearthed an extremely large set of bones. At first, they assumed it was just an old horse. It wasn't until later that an expert recognized the significance of their find. Zadok Thompson, a prominent naturalist and state geologist from Vermont, determined that this 12,000-year-old fossil bore a strong resemblance to the still existing beluga whale. But what was it doing buried eight feet deep in mud? As it turned out, the Charlotte whale fossil was proof that the area had a fascinating geological history long before Samuel de Champlain encountered it. This is the Charlotte whale, and it's, it's so named because um, it was found in, in Charlotte, Vermont. So it's one of the ways in which we knew back in the 19th century that um, salt water had once you know, existed here in the, in the Champlain Valley. According to geologists like Stephen Wright, the region was once a larger body of salt water known as the Champlain Sea. 
We currently think that the Champlain Sea existed here from approximately 11,000 years ago until somewhere in the 8 to 9,000 year um, range. So it was in existence for probably 2,000, maybe 2,500 years. But there is proof sea creatures inhabited these waters even further back in time. Isle of Mott is one of what we call the Champlain Islands. It's a, a largely limestone uh, formation that uh, is a relic from 450 million years ago, where you can see the very, very ancient uh, corals left from that era. Does the one-time presence of salt water shed light on modern unexplained sightings in Lake Champlain? Lake Champlain and Loch Ness and several other places were flooded by the ocean and actually became arms of the sea. And at that point, marine animals were free to come and go. Scott Martis is a researcher who's followed the stories about Champ for the last 10 years and even moved to Lake Champlain to study the legend. He thinks Champ's origins can be traced back thousands of years to when the brackish waters of the Champlain Basin drained north into the St. Lawrence River and the large opening to the sea was effectively closed. When that happened, some former saltwater creatures were trapped within Lake Champlain. They had little choice but to evolve or die. These uh, saltwater arms of the sea were cut off from the ocean, and whatever was living in these lakes either died out or adapted to fresh water and, and managed to survive. Scientists say that the idea is plausible. When you start talking about rumors of champ, it's not inconceivable, but one talks about probabilities when you talk about champ. It's not inconceivable we could have an ocean migrant who got hopelessly lost and was really intent on going upstream and could have wandered here from the ocean. Ellen Marsden is a University of Vermont fisheries biologist. She acknowledges that some fish found today in Lake Champlain evolved from saltwater ancestors. Most of them are native fish that have been here ever since the Champlain Sea receded. This lake became isolated from the ocean, uh, started to become a freshwater lake. Um, there were some fish that had remained in the lake from saltwater, such as our Atlantic salmon, our, our sturgeon. Could descendants of whales trapped in Lake Champlain explain the champ sightings? Mardis doesn't think so. Probably the classic theory that has been bandied about for Champ, the Loch Ness Monster, other lake monsters and sea serpents, that they may be surviving plesiosaurs. Thought to have been extinct for 65 million years, the remains of aquatic reptiles known as plesiosaurs have been found on almost every continent. Like beluga and other whales, the plesiosaur had lungs, not gills, meaning it had to come to the water's surface for air. Plesiosaurs came in many shapes and sizes, but a typical example had a long neck, a broad body, a short tail, and four paddle-like limbs it used to undulate through the water. To the vast majority of eyewitnesses, Champ looks like a plesiosaur, not a whale. And this woman may possess the best proof that prehistoric creatures still prowl the lake. July 5th, 1977, near St. Albans, Vermont. Okay, you two. Sandra Mancy and her two children and her husband are taking a leisurely afternoon drive. Grace, yeah. When they decide to pull over and walk along the lakefront. Do you see something out there? I think I see something out there. Kids, get back, get away from the water. Using her Instamatic camera, Mansi took the snapshot of what she saw. She said the head of the creature she saw rose six feet out of the water and at least 12 feet of its body was exposed. According to Mansi, the entire sighting lasted around five or six minutes. Cryptozoologist John Kirk has examined many champ sightings and says credible evidence like photos are rare. Sandra Mansi's picture at Lake Champlain is probably the best. 
But does science support the notion that a plesiosaur could exist today in this lake? Do I believe there's something unusual out there that we don't know something about? Absolutely. There's loads of stuff we don't know enough about out there. Do I believe there's a plesiosaur-type monster? No, no. Okay, Ted, swing it on in, and I want you to park it parallel to the lake. Up until recently, Scott Mardis's research has focused on the eyewitness accounts of others. Now, for the first time, he's going to try to find his own photographic evidence of Champ. Whoever wants to spend the money to do that sort of work needs to come here and do it and try it. That's the only way to find out. Jay, I think we've got uh, six camera traps total, three on the ground. Three on the Mardis ground. will be working with Monster Quest videographers Jay Cole and Jared Christie. Combined, they have 30 years' experience capturing images of animals in their natural habitat. So what we've done is we've brought out a research transport vehicle and set it up on a remote location of Lake Champlain. We've positioned ourselves here for an extended number of days because many people have told us the only way to find Champ is to actually be on the lake. Three camera system two color cameras and an um, infrared one to run underwater. The forward and reverse camera system is going to be the ticket to help us tour the lake and find this champ. Jay, where we're going to put these camera traps are in some of the hot spots out there in the lake where we've had quite a few sightings. The challenge in a lake that covers more than 400 square miles is where to begin. The answer may lie in the unusual findings of another expert. I was stunned at the size because I never imagined anything that big in Lake Champlain. As the numbers of settlers in the Lake Champlain area grew, so did the reports of sightings of their legendary lake monster. 1873 was a particularly busy year for Champ. The New York Times reported that a railroad crew on the lake had seen an enormous serpent head with shining scales. In July, Clinton County Sheriff Nathan H. Mooney reported an enormous snake or water serpent he thought was 25 to 35 feet long. The following month, the steamship W.B. Eddy encountered Champ by running into it. According to tourists on board, the ship nearly capsized. 19th century accounts of the monster gained such notoriety that showman P.T. Barnum posted a $50,000 reward for the monster's hide. Barnum intended, he explained, to add to my mammoth World's Fair show. Barnum's reward yielded nothing, but the sightings continued. Does a form of plesiosaur, or giant aquatic reptile, long thought to be extinct, live in Lake Champlain? Or is it something else? Back and forth across Lake Champlain, ferryboat captain B.J. Bombard has made the trip from Burlington to Port Kent thousands of times in his career. Most trips remain uneventful, except for one day in the mid-90s. I was on my normal ferry crossing on my route. I, I looked ahead, you could see something coming towards us, or something was there, and as we get closer, you could tell it was on a reciprocal course. As the strange object drew nearer, Bombard said he angled the ferry to get a better look. As I looked at it, it and we got closer, it kind of looked like you would guess what a submarine would look like if it were real close to the surface and it were just pouring water off the top of it. I got my binoculars out and I was looking at it and as we got closer, you could see that it just wasn't a log and it wasn't two things. It seemed to be just one, one particular mass that that's there and I would say it was probably a good six to eight feet long. I didn't see any dorsal fins or anything. That's, it's, it's weird, but you know, I just didn't see any fins at all. The closer I got, the more it looked like something, but I didn't know what. 
And Elizabeth von Muggenthaler will add, she's never heard anything like it. There is no known fish or mammal besides whale or dolphin that produce echolocation. It doesn't lie. I mean, the signal doesn't lie. Elizabeth von Muggenthaler is familiar with stories like Captain Bombard's. She grew up along the shores of Lake Champlain. Today, she is an acoustician who specializes in recording animal sounds. In June of 2002, equipped with an array of sophisticated underwater recording equipment, von Muggenthaler's team recorded audio within the deep waters of Lake Champlain. She was astounded by what she heard. We have over 10 minutes of this creature in three different places doing this echolocation. Echolocation, also called biosonar, is used by mammals for foraging and navigation. These animals emit sonar and listen to the echoes that return to locate and identify objects in their environment. Echolocation is literally biosonar. If you go out in your boat and you look at your little fish finder machine, you're actually using sonar. You're sending a beam of sound out in the water and it bounces back, it echoes back. Although she has studied whales and dolphins, von Muggenthaler says that what she recorded at Lake Champlain in 2002 is not a known animal. Instead, she believes the most logical explanation for the sounds is a uniquely evolved creature. The first sound that you will hear is the sound we record from Lake Champlain. And the second sound is killer whale. And you can actually hear the similarities. Very, very similar. It tells me that this animal is echolocating and it has an advanced, advanced brain. This is an ancient area. How are we to know that something different didn't develop when the sea got cut off from the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Atlantic Ocean? Experts don't think plesiosaurs had the ability to echolocate, but they could have developed this specialized behavior over time. The first time we got echolocation was right in here, at, uh, right around 24 feet in Button Bay. The second time we got echolocation was right in here at Hunter Bay. And the third place we got echolocation was right in Town Farm Bay at approximately 30 feet. I think the key to this is to very quickly intercept what you get on sonar with video equipment to identify it fast enough. Right. Champ researcher Scott Martis and his underwater video experts are targeting the area of von Muggenthaler's sound recordings for their search. They will begin just north of Burlington, Vermont, and work their way south towards von Muggenthaler's three locations. How does this look down here? Perfect. Camera trap two going down. Using sophisticated 24-hour surveillance cameras, the team will hunker down for the next five days and wait for Champ to appear. All right, all three cameras are still rolling. You can see the divers. You see the bottom of the lake. This looks good. The camera traps we've positioned all along the shore here in this very remote location of Lake Champlain. Yeah, that looks pretty good, though. To continuously roll video 24 hours a day. All right, recording. So if something were to swim by, swim up to shore at any point in the day, nighttime, daytime, sunshine, dark, light, we're gonna have video rolling. Dozens of cameras will monitor three points around Lake Champlain, 
each camera will provide a different view. Underwater, level with the lake surface, and up higher for a more expansive view of the lake. In order to find Champ, you need to live it, breathe it, smell it, touch it, everything. So this is where we're gonna be. We're gonna be here 24 hours a day, early in the morning down the lake, late at night down on the lake. We're gonna be eating here, we're gonna be sleeping here. This is the spot to be to search for Champ. The team has been careful to position one of their cameras along this shore. That's because nearby, more than 20 years ago, one eyewitness saw Champ on land. And it come out of the woods, and it come right here under the light, and it stopped. Although it's a seemingly tranquil place, Lake Champlain has been the setting for over 240 sightings of what some say is a monster. The first of these, in July of 1609, is frequently attributed to the lake's namesake, the French explorer Samuel de Champlain. The story that has been repeated, often in print, is that Champlain claimed to have seen a 20-foot serpent thick as a barrel and a head like a horse. But a closer look at his journals reveals something startling. Champlain's actual description doesn't say anything about a serpent. Instead, it says this. There is a great abundance of fish, the largest of them from eight to 10 feet long, with a snout two feet long and a double row of sharp, dangerous teeth. It is protected by scales of a silvery gray color so strong that a dagger could not pierce them. As menacing as this creature sounds, experts say there is a creature in Lake Champlain that fits this description. Lake Sturgeon. Its ancient looking armored body can reach lengths over seven feet. You could see a sturgeon near shore uh, doing a little bit of porpoising, enjoying itself perhaps at the surface, um, and would readily mistake that for something you'd never seen before and was pretty freaky looking. They've got a strange face, they've got a long nose that you don't expect in a fish. You might be thinking, horse? M monster? Um, their size, you know, would be pretty startling if one did surface. So I wouldn't put it past sturgeon being the origin of at least some champ sightings. While feeding or spawning, fish sometimes cluster head to tail near the surface, possibly creating the strange undulating humps reported by eyewitnesses. It was a beautiful, warm, one of those very special warm nights. The water was glass smooth. Off to our right, we could see a, a very gentle wake. Uh, no splashing, nothing, but we knew that there was something moving. So we knew we were looking at something very unusual uh, and probably the champ. Never have a camera when you need it. <gasps> Another theory, the humps are not animals at all, but rather man-made. Many's the time we've been out here working, playing in sailboats, what have you, and you see three humps moving through the water in sequence, big humps one after the other, and there's no boat in sight. But wakes last a long time. There's a boat three miles up the lake that created that wake, and you're still seeing that residue of the, of the wake rolling as it sort of exhausts itself down the middle of the lake. But if that is true, how do scientists account for a sighting of Champ not in the middle of the lake, but on land? Christine Hebert is at her family's marina just north of Burlington when her two dogs begin barking excitedly. This night, both the dogs were barking, and they were right on their hind legs with the leash right out. And it come out of the woods, and it come right here under the light, and it stopped. But it moved out, it turned around, and it went out into the darkness. One week later, the creature returned to Hebert's marina. My mother was with me this time. And the second time, I couldn't even talk. I was pulling my mother out and trying to tell her, champ, champ. And I watched a long time. So wherever it came from, it came very slow. And it didn't stop. It came, came right up to the, to the light. But that was a brown one. It was not as big as the green one. There was no mistake on the second sighting. 
I've been here all my life. I know exactly what a fish looks like. But that was not a fish. That was like a dinosaur head. Heber describes a plesiosaur-like creature that held its head high while walking. While there is disagreement on whether a plesiosaur could walk or even slither on land, most experts agree they did not have the bone structure to hold their necks up high for any period of time. Yet evolutionary adaptation does occur in animals over time to adapt to their changing environment. A stronger or longer neck could evolve from a need to reach a high food source, possibly on land. Another critical component of the Hebert account is that she saw two animals of different sizes. This could indicate a family. You need minimally about 50 animals to get away from the issues of inbreeding, to maintain a population over a few generations. If you want to talk about really having a stable population over time, we know from conservation biology, we're talking more like five, 600, maybe 1,000 individuals to maintain a population over time. But could Lake Champlain's ecosystem sustain such a large group of creatures? The lake is home to a wide variety of aquatic life, including large pike, trout, and carp, likely food sources for a plesiosaur or aquatic mammal. Still, if you've got 50 or 60 animals as big as Champ is reputed to be, they should be having a major dent in the food web of that lake. As members of Scott Martis's video team work the shoreline near Christine Hebert's marina, Martis and the remaining crew begin their search on the water. Big day, huh? Yeah. Yeah, here is that giant fish camera lure that you were talking about. Uh -huh. How's that look? Looks great. On this expedition, Martis is equipped with two unique underwater camera systems designed specifically for the Champ search. The first camera, a giant fish cam, is on a lure made to look like the lake trout that live in Lake Champlain. On the front of the lure, near the nose, is the aqua view camera. If Champ is a predator, it may be possible to trigger an attack with this flashing, fast-moving lure. Yes, yeah, so somewhere out in this area, it's most likely. The second apparatus, a high-speed forward reverse camera, is one of a kind. With AquaView cameras in both the front and the rear, the device is designed to move at speeds of up to 20 to 30 miles per hour. The element of surprise may be the answer. Another team of researchers possess the technology to actually see the creature, if it exists, though monster hunting is not the reason for being here. Geologists Tom and Pat Manley of Vermont's Middlebury College began mapping Lake Champlain in 1996. And there were two major components, one being the geological aspect, to actually look at all the detail within Lake Champlain, and the second aspect was to actually map all of the historical artifacts on the bottom of the lake. Although it was mapped once in the 1800s, the Manley's work is the most extensive and technologically sophisticated geological survey of the lake to date. They will employ side-scan sonar to map the topography of the lake bottom. For Champ researchers, the Manley's efforts could yield useful information about the lake's ecosystem and its depth. This is a side scan sonar. And what it does is it sends uh, out sound on each side of this, the starboard and the port side, along a whole swath. And as we tow it, we'll be able to see anything that's protruding above or below just the surface. The Manley's starting point today is one of Muggenthaler's echolocations. Thompson's Point. This is the direction of the travel of the boat. The red line is the port side, 50 meters out, so it shows you the range. And we're heading towards these dots, which represent the location of the little boat at the bottom of the lake. 
Now this is a log right in here at the bottom of the lake, probably 30, 40 feet long. So. Yeah, these are more, more fish. fish, schools of fish right in here. Dirty fingerprints. Here it is. Oh, this is a beautiful image. You can get to see the, the hatch work, the bowsprit. The Manly sonar images are so detailed, it is theoretically possible for them to capture an image of Champ. And if it's an air-breathing creature, you'd expect it to have reasonable-sized lungs, and we would expect to see a very, very large, huge hit on that. So far in their research, the Manleys have found many historic artifacts at the bottom of Lake Champlain. We've uncovered circa 70 brand new shipwrecks since we started this program, along with a lot of smaller artifacts that have been uh, located. But at this spot in 1990, they also found something unexpected. And you can see that there is an old channel that's still buried, you know, that you can still see some indication of, and then all of a sudden it makes this large drop off into a deeper area of the lake. For centuries, Lake Champlain in the American Northeast and Loch Ness in the highlands of Scotland have been famous for the monsters that are believed to lurk within their depths. Over the years, each lake has generated an emblematic photograph said to be the best evidence of its monster. This famous picture of Nessie, as the Loch Ness monster is affectionately known, was taken in 1934. For six decades, it withstood careful scientific examination. And then, in 1993, it emerged that the photo was a hoax. This monster was actually a toy submarine, which was modified with wood and plastic, and then floated and photographed. So far, the Sandra Mansi photograph of Champ, taken in 1977, but not revealed until 1980, has withstood scientific scrutiny. It's still a very interesting photograph, bar none, and if it is real, then it's the best of the lot. For some reason, those of us who dwell here in this country seem to have had better success than a lot of people from other countries who've attempted to film this phenomenon. I know we saw something in that lake, and had I not had the photograph, <laughs> never, never would I have told. Mansi says she clearly remembers what happened that day. I want people to know that this is real. This is exactly what I saw. I'm watching out there, and I could see, well, like turbulence or disturbance or something. And then the head and the neck right here broke the surface. My legs gave out. I went down on my knees. The whole thing hit me at that point. And I had the camera, and I picked the camera up, and I took the photograph. It started going down, but it wasn't like just like that. It was, it went down, it went off like this. Sandra Mansi believes she has the best image of Chap. But two scientists may have the technology to capture an even better image. Pat and Tom Manley of Middlebury College in Vermont are on their 80th expedition in their quest to map the entire bottom of the lake. In eight years on Lake Champlain, have they found evidence of Champ? That's one of the first questions that people usually ask us is whether we have seen Champ. And the answer is no, we, we have not. They have, however, found evidence of something else something that CHAMP researchers find encouraging. You can see that there is an old channel that's still buried, you know, that you can still see some indication of, and then all of a sudden it makes this large drop off into, the, uh, into a deeper area of the lake. This hidden highway runs through the deepest part of the lake. If these creatures do exist, could this channel explain how they have been able to hide and avoid capture for centuries? Even if I was driving a submarine in Lake Champlain, if that submarine was at a different elevation than we were actually mapping, we'd never see it. It also runs directly through one of the three locations 
where audio expert Elizabeth von Muggenthaler recorded the echolocations of an unknown creature in 2002. The underwater river channel found by the Manleys runs past Thompson Point, where Scott Martis has returned for a fourth day. Scott Martis and his underwater team have returned to the lake on this, the last day of their expedition, with their camera lure. Today, they've enlisted the help of Captain Al Martin. I've owned Point Bay Marina for 37 years, so over the years, I've heard about all the stories that have come, come to light. The final spot Martis and Martin have chosen to search for Champ is Thompson Point, at the bottom of the old riverbed discovered by geologists Pat and Tom Manley. This is the deepest part of the entire lake, and one of three locations from which Elizabeth von Morgenthaler recorded an unknown creature echolocating in 2002. Everything's hooked up, camera is rolling. At the moment, it's 393 underneath the boat. Uh -huh. Angle's good, we're at 450 feet on the cable. Scott, what are we seeing? Mostly just water right now. Yeah, I'm seeing something. Uh, this is really, it's really strange. If Champ, the mysterious denizen of Lake Champlain, truly exists, he is an oddly Frankenstein-like animal, a shadowy creature with curious patchwork of mammalian, reptilian, and fish-like characteristics. This man, like many eyewitnesses, said he saw Champ glide through the water like a large fish or snake. This woman says she saw two Champs, a green one and a brown one, walking on land. This acoustics expert says Champ produces biosonar somewhat similar to a dolphin or whale, but unlike any known creature. And this woman says she saw the creature lift its neck six feet out of the water. That's when she took this picture. I saw something. I know I, nobody's going to believe me at this point. Although Mansi has remained steadfast in recounting this version of events, critics say there are some problems with her story. Benjamin Radford is a writer with the Skeptical Inquirer, a publication that has long maintained that Champ is a great story and nothing more. If you just glance at the photo and you say, yeah, that could be a lake monster, then it's, it's compelling. But if you take more time with it, if you more closely examine it, if you do the investigation, the story falls apart. Mansi acknowledges that she doesn't remember where, exactly, she stopped with her husband and children that day. I know that we were not into Canada. I know we were on the Vermont side. And I know that it took us probably an hour and a half to two hours to get back to where I knew where I was. But her inability to pinpoint her location makes it difficult, if not impossible, for experts to examine the veracity of her story. And the problem is that in the photo itself, there's almost nothing of scale. There's not like a boat nearby or a person or anything in the, in the foreground or background, really, that, that you can tell how far away the object is. Sandra Mansi said it was, I think, between 8 and 16 feet. Uh, one person had claimed that he had done analysis based on the wave height in, in, the, in the photograph that it was up to like, like, I think, 60 or 80 feet long. Now, which is it? Is it, is, is it, is it uh, 10 feet long? Is it 50 feet long? Is it 30 feet long? What is it? According to Mansi, some experts agree with her estimates. In 1991, an oceanographer at the University of British Columbia examined the photo. I said six to eight feet out of the water this way and maybe eight, 10 feet that way, 12 feet. An oceanographer studied the photograph, Dr. Paul LeBlanc, and he tells, according to the wave pattern, it's much bigger than that. But according to LeBlanc, his results are only as accurate as the estimates given to him by Mansi. So what is Radford's explanation for the image in the photograph? Uh, I've come to the conclusion that it's almost certainly a floating log. Radford believes Mansi's image is debris carried from the bottom of the lake. I've seen cases where a, a, uh, a stick coming up out of the water can appear to be moving because the wind is actually pushing the water across it. 
Decomposition creates gases within rotting wood, making them more buoyant and for a brief moment propelling them to the surface before sinking slowly again into the lake. It's important to realize that there's more than one explanation for lake monster sightings. Any number of things uh, that aren't immediately identified can be interpreted as, as lake monsters. In the case of the Mansi photo, this image could be the root of a tree trunk that was pushed to the surface before descending again into the depths. So what I've done is through my animation, I, I took a scale model of a tree stump and I rotated it 360 degrees to show how a tree stump could look like a lake monster from a certain perspective. My analysis of the Mansi photograph, I was trying to show that uh, the head and the neck aren't connected. It, it looks like they are because there's a little patch right here uh, that is actually a shadow from, from the sun coming down, but the head and the neck aren't part of the same uh, creature coming down. But Mansi herself is unmoved by this hypothesis. It has been scrutinized for almost 30 years, and they can call me anything they want and think anything they want, but they cannot debunk the photograph. You know why? This is what I saw. You get parts where it's bouncing around the mud, but then you get other shots that's very clear at the bottom. It's been six hours, and at 30 miles per hour, Scott Martis has covered most of the deep channel, but they've found nothing. Great shots at the bottom. You can see the muscles and everything very clearly. So if Champ or a sturgeon or whatever had been down there, we would have got excellent video footage of it. It's not a question of the equipment we were, we were using. It's just a question of luck if the animals were going to show up, you know? Back ashore, the news from the fixed camera surveillance effort is disheartening as well. That shot right there. Uh, right up and through here, you can usually see something. After reviewing hundreds of hours of surveillance video, it's clear Lake Champlain is teeming with creatures, but there's no evidence of champ. You know, we went through, you know, hours and hours of footage, and we weren't able to identify anything that came up. Um, maybe it's the wrong time of year. Still, Scott Martis is not discouraged. He intends to continue his pursuit of champ, despite the disappointing result of this expedition. Everybody has to, to look at the available evidence and make up their own mind on that. If I turn out to be wrong, I could at least be justified by saying, well, look at, look at, look at what I base my, my belief on. It's this body of evidence over here. Scott Martis and Sandra Mansi are drawn together against a world of skeptics. Hi, Sandra. We've met before. I'm Scott Martis, cryptozoologist. Hi, Scott. How are you? Among experts, opinions on Champ's existence range from guarded optimism to something more hopeful. I think that Sandra Mansi is probably a sincere, honest eyewitness uh, who just happens to be wrong about what she saw. Yeah, I do occasionally have people come and tell me they've seen something bizarre, and then you sort of ask enough questions to say, did it have this kind of mouth, or was it doing this, or was it in this part of the water? And then you can say, ah, what you've seen is a sturgeon, a sea lamprey, uh, um, you know, spawning population of minnows. I still think it's a big fish, if it's going to be anything at all. Echolocation only exists in those creatures that have a highly evolved communication center, like whales and dolphins. I would like to know what it is, but if we do find out, I hope we leave it alone. In fact, the eyewitness accounts are so common and apparently credible. In 1982, both the Vermont House of Representatives and the New York State Senate passed laws to protect Champ. Even without definitive proof, the creature was put on the endangered species list as a precaution. The law will protect the creature if anyone eventually does come upon a Champ. And until that happens, those who are inclined to believe can take some comfort in the intriguing scientific findings generated from these investigations. The echolocation found in Lake Champlain is the first and only echolocation found in a freshwater lake. And for that itself, the science is amazing.
Canada is home to a centuries-old legend. It's easier to avoid people here today than it was 150 years ago. History supports the possibility of a monster called Sasquatch. We've been coming here for years and years and kind of felt like we were being watched. At a remote fishing cabin in northern Ontario. The cabin had been broke into. It was a terrible mess. Science examines the evidence in a modern-day search for proof. Does that look like tissue to you? It kind of does. It's almost like it came from a wild human. Yep. They're going to be watching us this whole time. They'd become the target of the beast's rage. We're cowering in here. I'm, I'm afraid for the first time. Did you hear that? Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. <laughs> Snell Grove Lake, pristine and remote, nestled in one of North America's great untouched wilderness areas in Ontario, 250 miles north of Canada's capital of Ottawa. Accessible only by float plane, it's a fisherman's paradise. There is a cabin here that is the focal point of a series of seemingly aggressive incidents by the creature Canadians call Sasquatch. This thing starts screaming at me, starts wailing at me. It freaked me right out. Like, I just, I couldn't believe it. It just freaked me right out. It's like a man that says, but the first thing you see is the long arms. It happened to walk off on two legs. To me, it sounded like an ape. So if there is a Sasquatch, perhaps this is what it's supposed to look like. Most describe a creature up to eight feet tall, upwards of 800 pounds, hairy and upright walking with long arms, no neck, and a human-looking face. The name Sasquatch can be traced to the 1920s when it was coined by J.W. Burns, a school teacher in British Columbia. Burns compiled Native American accounts of tall, man-like animals said to live in the forests. Each tribe had a different name, but Burns determined they were all talking about the same animal. An animal that this man believes could still be around. Scott Mossbeck owns the only single cabin fishing camp on Snell Grove Lake, which he rents to visiting fishermen. One fall, my father came in to check on the cabin because I'd forgot to put some antifreeze in the drains prior to leaving. He came in to do that and discovered the cabin had been uh, broke into. The refrigerator was ripped from the wall. He came over here, knocked all the plates, everything off the shelves, ripped the stove out, flipped it on the ground. I came over here and I said at least he didn't get in the shower room because the door was closed, but when I opened the door, the sink was on the ground. He jumped off, bent the shower door. All the shelves in the building were ripped down. The stove pipes were pulled down, soot everywhere. Everything was on the floor. Most of these outposts would be lucky to see 50 people in a season. There is uh, virtually no population, hardly anyone year-round, and only us visiting in the summer. Mossbeck says a creature has visited the camp regularly, seemingly angry about the cabin and sometimes the occupants. In 2003, Joe Fraschella and some fishing buddies were enjoying a week of walleye and northern pike fishing at the camp when they were paid a midnight visit. We uh, flew in to Snell Grove Lake. We've been coming here for years and years. We always got this kind of weird feeling. Kind of felt like we were being watched. Maybe much like a zoo animal would feel. It was just a feeling that I could never shake every time we went back in this area. Later, the group heard what they described as distant wood knocking or pieces of wood banged together. They decided to knock back. The, the person who heard the wood knock said, let's try wood knocking and see if we can get some kind of response. Later that evening, their fears became real. 
and the one person in our party had gone to brush his teeth and the moment he got in front of the kitchen window the cabin started shaking and he heard this kind of screaming and screeching noise then the cabin started to shake, it started to vibrate. He felt like it, the cabin was being lifted. It, it really scared him and he ran over to try to wake up one of the dads and, and pounded him on the shoulder and tried to get him up and he couldn't get him up. Then the, the screaming and the cabin shaking just stopped. Frischella and his buddies found no evidence of what attacked the cabin that night. Nor has Mossbeck found an explanation for the extensive cabin damage that same year. He made such a mess that at first I thought it had to be kids. I didn't believe even an animal would do it, but there's no way for them to get here. The largest town close to us would be 10,000 people, and that's 200 miles away. Historically, most reports of property damage in remote areas can be attributed to bears in search of food. Dr. Lynn Rogers is a wildlife biologist specializing in black bear research in Ely, Minnesota. Rogers has seen the damage bears can inflict on remote cabins and has viewed the Mossbeck tape. The thing that just hit me about it was how thoroughly that cabin was trashed. Everything was on the floor and broken up and tipped over and heavy things. It was obviously something strong that did it. Right away, my first thought would be bear. But this is sometime between October 1st and the middle of the winter. Bears up that far north, towards the north edge of their range, should be in hibernation during that time. If they go for the refrigerator, they very often uh, are not going so much for the contents in there, but for the insulation. And formaldehyde is one of the ingredients of making this, and it breaks down into formic acid, which smells like uh, an ant colony. And so then you look for bite marks and, and claw marks where they tore open the inside of the refrigerator to get the, to the insulation. I didn't see any of that in this case. I really am baffled ab about what did this. Tom Steenberg is a Sasquatch researcher from Mission, British Columbia. We have more wilderness than most European countries have total land mass. So the idea that something uh, unknown could exist here, not discovered, is no shock to me at all. It's easier to avoid people here today than it was 150 years ago, in my opinion. We no longer have nomadic First Nations tribes moving from one area to point A to point B. Um, we no longer have the vast amount of mountain men making their living off the land like we used to in the past. So the total number I would say would in Canada, in my guess, is about 150 to 200 a year. Well, the same total number in the United States would probably be about three to four times as much due to the density population and the wilderness areas available south of the border. So I would guess anywhere between 450 and 500 reports a year. But is there hard evidence to support the stories of an up to eight foot tall, 800 pound Sasquatch? In 2003, Mossbeck laid out a common bear deterrent at the door of the Snow Grove cabin, a bed of screws. This is what we made for the creatures that have broken to our cabin in the past. This is where the remnants of the blood was from the la last time. It was a few, few days old when we found it. Uh, it had been about three days since we'd been here. And that's how we set it when we leave if we're gonna be gone for more than a day. To go, we're all loaded. One of you can go in and go co-pilot. Okay, I will. Okay, you're in first up through the center. Next best seat. The blood evidence, the remote location, and the high number of encounters make Snow Grove Lake a prime spot for a monster quest search. Mossbeck asks scientists Jeff Meldrum and Kurt Nelson to investigate. If Sasquatches are real, that they probably are in Canada.
from the air, it's simply uh, uh, awe-inspiring, the, the expansiveness of the, of the wilderness. Given the, the location and, and the lack of population around here, it certainly wouldn't surprise me for something like that animal to be able to live here without being detected. There are very few trails, uh, very few uh, pathways through this wilderness uh, on foot. For all practical purposes, the bush in between these lakes is unexplored. Dr. Kurt Nelson is a microbiologist at the University of Minnesota. He's anxious to examine the screw board for any remaining blood, hair, or tissue. DNA could provide the most conclusive proof of the creature's identity. This is really uh, a remarkable spot. Thanks. Wow, this is great. It's a good flight. So this is the nail board that Chuck made to prevent an that animal from coming back in here and wrecking the place. Right. And uh, he said that there was a good blood stain on it. Right. Uh, somewhere in here in the center, he said there was quite a pool of blood, but I guess it's been sitting out here in the weather for the past two years, and, and at this point, I don't see anything remaining. Yeah, if there was a dried sample of blood there, that'd be worth taking, but anything that's been subjected to the weather is going to be totally degraded DNA. The uh, backside may have preserved a sample that we could use. Well, there is a stain there. It looks like this is where it was. There's some material clinging to these, the threads on these screws in a few places. Uh, does that look like tissue to you? It kind of does. Well, maybe this is tissue. We should probably... Uh, Collect a sample just to be on the safe side, take it back and have a closer look at it in the lab. Yeah, okay, so I'm just gonna take a little bit of this. It's stiff, it's really, it's really dry onto these screws. It's hard to get it off. I didn't hold out much hope for the possibility of uh, DNA from this old blood sample, but with these threaded screws and what may be tissue samples, it's a whole new ball game. Who or what left the flesh, blood, and hair behind? The answers may be as easy as connecting the dots. So if you start just on this edge where the blood leaked behind and look at the screws that have this tissue on them, I think that one maybe does. This one is for sure covered. I mark that one. Uh, that one's too rusty, you right. can't tell. That one for sure. This one I'm not quite, let me, let me look, because this helps. It almost seems to have a hair attached to it. Well, we'd call it a fiber at this stage of the investigation. Yeah. So, I don't know, do you think it's a positive screw? It's uh, kind of questionable. I'd say it's questionable. That one for Definitely sure. Definitely here. What if we just now try to connect the dots and just get an overall idea of uh, the general shape of what we're looking at and size uh, of this? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. view of the whole periphery because that's where hair mites now. Dr. Kurt Nelson yeah. and Dr. Jeff Meldrum are examining the blood-soaked screw doormat that camp owner Scott Mossback put on the cabin porch. Oh, that one looks interesting. Look at that. Oh, wow. They have found blood, hair, and tissue. We have no nails over here. Yeah, there just is no nail. Then we end up with something that looks more like this. The bloody outline reveals what appears to be a large footprint. But it doesn't take a lot of imagination to extend that out, and you've got, essentially, the outline of a Sasquatch footprint. This simulation illustrates Nelson and Meldrum's theory the creature put its full weight on the screws, forcing them an inch into its foot. The creature likely was shocked and stepped back off the porch the same way it had entered, ripping hair and large pieces of tissue from the foot as it left. So I'd say we're looking at a footprint that is at least 17, if not 18 inches long. Uh, 
the, the flesh samples uh, were, were stunning uh, as, as we, we noticed it. I mean, at first I was a little dubious that we'd have anything worthwhile given the length of time that it had been out in the weather. But as we began to look closer and what had appeared to be just red paint, then obviously was not, was, was dried blood, and the pattern of distribution was quite distinct. So uh, there's a very good likelihood we'll be able to get DNA from that sample, at least enough to determine whether it was just a bear or whether it was something with a much larger, very distinctively shaped foot. One of the first white men to document evidence of the Canadian creature was explorer David Thompson. In 1811, while searching for a waterway from the Hudson Bay to the Columbia River, Thompson discovered something unexpected. January 7th, continuing our journey in the afternoon, we came on the track of a large animal. The snow about six inches deep in the ice. I measured its four large toes, each of four inches in length, to each a short claw. The ball of the foot sunk three inches lower than the toes. The hinder part of the foot did not mark well. The length, 14 inches by eight inches in breadth. The men and Indians would have it be a young mammoth, and I held it to be the track of a large old grizzly bear. Yet the shortness of the nails, the ball of the foot, and its great size was not that of a bear. The 18 inch print found by Meldrum and Nelson is surprisingly similar in size to the print described by explorer David Thompson. The prints resemble that of a black bear, commonly found throughout the area but black bear paws generally max out at around nine inches. The much larger Kodiak and polar bear have paws as large as 14 or 15 inches, but their range is much further west and north. Footprints constitute the largest body of existing evidence, but for the trained eye, much can be learned from an animal track. It isn't just looking at tracks or the other signs that are out there, as long as we can keep our eyes and all our senses opened up to the whole world that's right there in front of us. What is real exciting is to follow these tracks because they tell you everything what's going on with the animal. Where is he going? What's he eating? How's he living his life? So in essence, tracking an animal tells more of a story than just seeing an animal for that fleeting second. Kiefer Irwin is a professional tracker. In August of 1984, while on vacation in Canada, she found tracks she could not explain. We had been seeing grizzly tracks. We saw a black bear that day. We were seeing caribou and moose, and we had seen all these tracks within that week. But these were something different of what I had not, not seen before. I recognized the track itself as a human-type track, but what befuddled us was that it was 16 inches long, its width approximately seven inches wide, and two inches of an impression, which meant something very heavy had put those tracks down. And it wasn't just one track, there were five of them. Between those tracks was a good four to five feet of a stride. Somebody said it could have been a grizzly standing up walking, but these had no claw marks. They had toes, but no claw marks. And a, a grizzly's claws, which extend out a good few inches from the front of its toes, would have definitely made an impression in that wet sand. We kind of nonchalantly, very casually said, yeah, must be a Sasquatch. You know, we were almost very lighthearted about it. We just said, it because, you know, there wasn't anything else it could have possibly have been. There was nothing. Back at Snowgrove Lake, Meldrum and Olson find something. A diary that apparently belonged to a fisherman who rented the cabin a decade ago. This dates to uh, 8, 9, 95. Fifth day here at the cabin. Uh, they found an unidentified footprint 
on the portage to Broken Mouth River, which appeared to be about a size 16 triple E. Wow. Uh, barefoot human type footprint. Huh. See, okay. Do you know where that is on the map? I've got a map right here. Uh -huh. This is my field map. Good. So we're here. Mm -hmm. Broken Mouth is down here. Just right. to probably. So the portage must be. Two miles be from us. It must be right in through here. Right through there. Boy, it's quiet and still out here. Hello. Hello. Nelson and Meldrum have developed a simple strategy. Surround the cabin with camera traps and make lots of noise to draw a creature in. There's kind of a nice opening back here. We can maybe position it to watch that. Meldrum believes the creature is unafraid of humans and may even initiate contact. He plans to target this behavior. Across here. Right. Stealth cam digital camera traps are strategically placed in the forest near the cabin. Okay, now we gotta set it up. Okay. All right, let's go. One, two, three. There you go. Nelson will set out to the Broken Mouth River Portage, mentioned in the fisherman's diary. The trip is more difficult than anticipated. The three-mile creek from Snellgrove Lake leading to Broken Mouth River is now low and strewn with boulders and small logs. Yeah, I think that probably the best way to see one isn't to go out and find it yourself because I don't think uh, you can stalk one. I don't know, people don't know how to do that. I think the best thing to do is to try to attract them to you. So my goal in coming on this trip was to go up by myself. I wanted to be by myself on a, on a remote outpost camp where the rest of the guys were back at, at the cabin so that I could separate myself from all of that and maybe um, make myself more attractive to a Sasquatch that could approach and be interested in human beings because they seem to be. There's lots of cases of them coming into camps. Kurt has targeted a camping spot on the opposite side of the lake, a 200-foot-wide moss-covered rock located near a swamp and an open area that will be covered with camera traps. Great bed. Well, Kurt, this should prove to be an interesting night. I hope so. It's about 10 o'clock. I got dropped off by those guys about three hours ago, and I've been busy setting up camera traps and I think good spots off the end of the clearing where I'm camped in. It's beginning to rain, actually, a little bit, and uh, so that's all for now. Back at camp. Meldrum is reaching out. He wants to try something Snellgrove fisherman Joe Frischella tried in 2003, wood knocking. Wood knocking is a common communication device used by great apes. It allows the animals to communicate over long distances. So far, it's a one-way conversation. It's uh, 3.30 a.m. and it's been raining like crazy. I've been in my sleeping bag for a while in this little tent to stay out of the rain. Hours pass and Nelson is having a long night. And I'm gonna try doing some rock banging. I'm gonna bang two rocks together to see if I can make a, a good smacking sound. And uh, I'm gonna try hollering off into the wilderness too just to see if I get any kind of a reply from that. Check back later. 
At Snellgrove Lake, Ontario, where men tread seldom, there is a cabin. As strange as it sounds, this cabin has allegedly been violated more than once by a large unknown animal, believed to be a Sasquatch. But this is not the first account of an aggressive Sasquatch. Albert Osman lived fairly close to my home and I got to know him very well. I've interviewed him numerous times. John Green is a retired Canadian journalist and a leading researcher into the Bigfoot phenomenon. He is a graduate of both the University of British Columbia and Columbia University and has a database of more than 3,000 sighting and track reports, earning him the nickname Mr. Sasquatch. While researching his book Sasquatch, The Apes Among Us, Green interviewed Canadian outdoorsman Albert Ostman, recording his detailed and strange account. Ostman claimed he was kidnapped and held captive by a family of Sasquatch in 1924 while he was prospecting in British Columbia, Canada. This is the actual audio recording of Ostman's account made in 1966. I was out on a prospecting trip. Mm -hmm. I was in, I think it was about six or seven days. Then I was camping at the place there. And they uh, began to bother me at night there. And I thought first there would be porcupines or probably bear or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, evidently there was something else. And uh, that went on for about three, four nights. And finally one night I was picked up by, in my sleep and carried away. He carried me for, I don't know, well, probably three, four hours. Then I was let down in the, in the valley, where, uh, of course, it was dark, you know. I heard a lot of chatter around. So a little after four o'clock in the morning when he let me down. Ostman claimed the creature carried him in a sleeping bag, which also contained food supplies and his rifle. Ostman didn't feel threatened by the strange creatures, but he also didn't feel free to leave, so he settled in and made his own camp. Finally, when it got lighter, I noticed these people around me, four of them, two big ones and two small ones, but they were all covered with hair and no clothes. Never bothered me. They, evidently, they had some reason why they wanted me there. I had uh, enough wood gathered up so I cooked coffee. And I guess the aroma from that brought him near and he was sitting about 10 feet away from me when I was drinking my coffee. And then I opened a box of snuff, you see. And I, when I opened that and took a pinch, you know, he reached out for it, you know. And he emptied it right in his mouth. And, and he swallowed it. And uh, that didn't feel very good, you know tastes very good, I guess so. And then he, he had to have something to drink, I guess. So he grabbed that and he drank the coffee can, ground and all. As a result of the snuff and the coffee, the beast ran off, likely looking for water. That's when Ostman made his escape. It's not a story that anybody would be inclined to believe today. The problem is that the descriptions that he gave of these individuals uh, have been consistently supported throughout the years by you know, subsequent observations. If the Ostman Sasquatch, like the Snellgrove creature, is real, they must eat. Dr. Meldrum struggles with whether this wilderness has enough food sources to sustain a large beast. An animal uh, that is uh, at one with its surroundings, like a Sasquatch or any other animal that, that frequents these areas, would certainly find ample resources uh, abounding here in the Canadian forest. Snellgrove Lake and the surrounding area is frozen all but 10 to 12 weeks a year. 
an 800-pound animal would likely need more than just lichen, berries, and roots to sustain itself. But Meldrum may have found another source. One of the plentiful food sources here in the North Bush are spruce grouse, which are uh, rather tame, unafraid of, of humans. And um, as an experiment, I attempted to hunt one down myself and was able to stalk one to within a few feet. Had I wanted to dispatch it, it would have been very easy to do so, uh, even by hand, let alone picking up a stone and uh, uh, knocking it down or knocking it from a low tree branch where they often roost. Meldrum theorizes Sasquatch would most likely be nomadic moving through the area during the months of June, July, and August, when food sources are at their peak. The same time fishermen inhabit the cabin at Snowgrove Lake. For Meldrum and Nelson, bad weather may have hampered last night's efforts. It is already late on day three, and Meldrum is anxious to pick up Nelson from his remote camping spot. Ah, I'm glad to see you guys. Yeah, okay. Must have been a fun experience. Oh, it was neat, but it rained a lot. Yeah. Um, I didn't hear anything. I, uh, I had the camera traps out. It is the team's final night at Snowgrove Lake. After three days of noise and foraging, they are still holding out hope for an encounter. The huge fire acts as a beacon, its glow visible for miles. The team is waiting with infrared and thermal cameras to see into the night. They are ready, or so they think. At around midnight, without warning, something happens. They were probably watching us this whole time. Of course, of course they were. Something has thrown a rock at the camp. Did you hear that? That rock was a pretty good size. I'm still shaking. It I sounded think it, to me I think like it's still it hit beyond that side and hit this. I thought it came over the crowd into this side. side. I don't want to get to the building. No, please. Just, just stay here. Just We've had action though. We've had rocks down. thrown at us. Throughout history, the Canadian wilderness has been home to hunters, trappers, and explorers. It may also be home to a monster. People now, the general population has more knowledge of the, the subject as a whole. And now people can, without too much difficulty, find someone to actually report it to. Whereas in the past, no one had any idea who to report something like this to. The Sasquatch is similar to other creatures seen around the world, but is also different. The Yeti is said to be a quadruped or an ape that moves on all fours. The Almasti is a Russian wild man that is more like man than ape and uses fire. Sasquatch is more like an ape or unknown primate. Most reports also point to how elusive and shy these animals are, avoiding human contact, but not always. Sasquatch sightings happen when they come close to people, not the other way around. Most eyewitness encounters end as suddenly and harmlessly as they began, but not at Snowgrove. Eyewitnesses claim this beast does not seem to like visitors. Oh, I don't know what make that sound. I wasn't that close to it, but I really heard it. I, I can't believe it. I really can't believe it. Without warning, a rock flies out of the woods and hits the cabin. Right, one of us was urinating off the porch about when the first stone hit the side of the cabin. This rock on the side of the building was bang. That's scary. That's it's amazing. It's always stuff you hear about that doesn't happen to you. I've been in the woods a lot. I camped a lot. And I was out in the woods all by myself last night. Camera crews scan the immediate area with the night vision and thermal cameras as the team retreats into the cabin. That's yeah. so weird. This is, this is quite exciting, I have to admit. I've not experienced anything quite this dramatic before. One crew member threw a rock back into the woods, only to have another rock thrown back. Uh, and that was followed shortly after by a, a rather larger rock uh, bouncing down the roof of the cabin. Um, this is quite, quite distinct. Uh, obviously, there's nothing in the woods 
that's uh, recognized anyway that can lob rocks in that fashion. And we're all together. I'm with everybody, so I know that it's nobody goofing around. While one cameraman scouts around the area, the rest of the team locked themselves into the cabin for the night. We came in from outside and we're, we're, we're cowering in here. I'm, I'm afraid for the first time and it was for sure a rock and it was for sure on the roof of the building. Yeah, so we've, we're back inside the cabin at the moment. We've turned down the lights inside and so we can get a better view through the windows and just see if anything uh, goes through our uh, line of sight. The morning could not come soon enough for Meldrum, Nelson, and the entire crew. And at first light, the camp's owner, Chuck Mossback, has returned to fly the crew out. What happened? We really had some action last night. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it was amazing. Um, An examination of the area reveals no tracks or other evidence. But whatever hit the roof that night may still be there. Only primates use tools as weapons. Rock and stick throwing is common in chimps and great apes. Good throwing rock. Whatever or whomever threw the rocks at the cabin is never revealed. But Meldrum and Nelson leave with an ample supply of blood, hair, and tissue from the screwboard. Todd DeSatel of New York University's microbiology lab has agreed to run DNA tests on the blood and tissue samples. If it is not too degraded or too old, um, we can probably recover DNA from it. Well, let's get this uh, exported to the server and we'll go run the analysis. Not only can this exacting process reveal the identity of a known creature, but it could be the best way to identify a new species like a Sasquatch. Once we can recover DNA, we can amplify it, make billions of copies of it in a matter of hours in the laboratory, and then we can see, do we have an exact match to something that's known, or is it closely related to something that's known? It will take several weeks before DNA tests reveal a missing link or known creature. The large quantity of tissue and hair will allow for numerous tests. Hair morphology is a much faster examination and also can reveal much about what stepped on the screws at the cabin. If this is just the hair of a known animal like a bear, Dr. Lynn Rogers, a wildlife biologist in Ely, Minnesota, should be able to quickly identify it. Northern Canada is mostly a vast, uninhabited wilderness. But even with a small human population, eyewitnesses occasionally report encounters with Sasquatch. This man first recorded finding 14-inch tracks in 1811. This man claims the animal shook his fishing cabin. And this cabin fishing camp at Ontario's Snellgrove Lake has become the scene of multiple incidents. But by what? And why? He made such a mess that at first I thought it had to be kids. I didn't believe even an animal would do it, but there's no way for them to get here. The largest town close to us would be 10,000 people, and that's 200 miles away. One expert says he does not believe a bear is responsible for the cabin's destruction. Right away, my first thought would be bear. But this is sometime between October 1st and the middle of the winter. Bears up that far north, towards the north edge of their range, should be in hibernation during that time. And an unknown beast left an 18-inch bloody footprint at the scene. And one of the things that, that impresses me is this is much larger than uh, what we might expect for a bear footprint. History supports the possibility Sasquatch may be real. But will science support the probability? The morphology exam on the hair found in the screws is complete. 
So I looked at I looked at the hair under a microscope and compared it to every other North American mammal, especially the ones that live in northern northern Ontario, and it didn't match with anything, and it's certainly not bear. Uh, it looked human to me, but um, there were two important differences in the morphology. One is that uh, under a microscope there was no m medulla. Human hair has a spongy center mass of tissue called the medulla and the other one that it had a naturally worn tip, a tapered tip. This had not been cut. It's almost like it came from a wild human. That left me confused about what it could be, and I'll be really interested to see what the DNA shows. Mitochondrial DNA is the most accurate method known for species identification, and should be able to pinpoint whether the hair sample is that of a man, or a non-human primate. Once we can recover DNA, we can amplify it, make billions of copies of it in a matter of hours in the laboratory, and then we can sequence those copies. We can determine the exact linear sequence of the DNA bases, the A, C's, G's, and T's. Once we have those, we can compare them to a database of basically all the known living organisms on the planet today. But Professor Dissetel has hit a wall extracting DNA. We actually did not get DNA, so in, in a sense, I don't even have a result. There was not DNA present in the material given to us. Either that material was so degraded that any viable DNA within it had basically been destroyed by other organisms or by um, nature, or those were not biological samples. Dr. Kurt Nelson also has been doing DNA tests on the blood, hair, and tissue samples, and suspects there is an unknown substance or inhibitor present that is interfering with the DNA extraction. Nelson must first identify the inhibitor and then remove it from the sequence. The inhibitor has been identified. The galvanizing on the screws was mixed in with the animal DNA Nelson can now nudge DNA from the purified samples. The scientific evidence at this point is suggesting that there really is an animal there. I cut it out, I repurified it, and I amplified it again using the same primers. I got a very strong reaction when I did that. And the reason was that I had gotten rid of the inhibitory stuff by running it out that way. And I found that it was identical to human DNA except it had one nucleotide polymorphism. That nucleotide that was different was a difference that is shared with chimpanzees. I got DNA that was primate DNA, and I knew that I might be looking at the DNA of a Sasquatch. The DNA says primate, but not quite human, and not quite non-human primate. One of the base pairs is deviated. The thing we have to do now is we have to look at more DNA. We have to sequence more of it. We have to design primers to amplify different regions of the DNA so that we can get sequence across the mitochondrial genome and determine whether or not it is just human DNA, which seems unlikely that something that a human would step on that board like that. Great apes share nearly identical DNA with man, except for a 35 base pair deviation. The Snellgrove DNA sample has only one deviation. According to Nelson, there is only a one in 5,000 chance this is human DNA. What we're looking at is the blood so far. So if we can find that the same sequence exists in the tissue and in the hair, that indicates that an animal, um, that the animal that bled there and, and left the tissue there and left the hair there was all the same animal and produced that sequence. That's important to tie it all together. And that could take a year. It appears science may support the probability of a primate that is not quite human and not quite ape. But just what left the bloody footprint at that Snell Grove Lake cabin? Is it possible that the creature of Snell Grove Lake is a real animal? You add it all up and it's very interesting. In the end, the creature of Snell Grove Lake may really roam the forests of Canada. Whether this creature is a genetically mutated man or a yet to be discovered animal, the Monster Quest search will return to Snellgrove Lake for a more extensive search. 
a search for a legend that might finally step out from the dark shadows and into the light of reality. thousand feet below the surface, the search is on for a monster. That thing ready to drop? We got one on, Tom, we got one on. For a giant-sized squid as big as a ship. A risky plan that's never been tried before. We have a squid on, squid on with a camera, all right. The danger is real. There's some big thing down there swimming around us. It gets me right in the arm and pulls my shoulder right out of the socket. <laughs> And the results could make history. First impressions, gut reaction, it's big. Whoa! Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers. On Monster Quest. The Sea of Cortez. A deep channel of water surrounded by the hilly Baja Peninsula and Mexico's mainland. Hundreds of years ago, pirates hid in coves here, preparing to ambush Spanish galleons. Folklore tells of vast treasures still hidden along this magnificent coastline. But further out to sea, something else hides within deep waters. For as long as they can remember, the native Pangaros here have feared something they call El Demonio Rojo, the Red Devil, and accounts dating back centuries say it's a man-killer. This one may just be a baby. Imagine a 100-pound carnivorous macaw parrot. It's built very strangely. It has a bunch of legs coming out of its head. So it can fly over to you grab you with all of its arms. Then you get the chitinous ring teeth, suction cups grabbing onto you. Continue to bite and bite and bite and bite and take chunks out of you. These experts are describing a very real creature. Demonio Rojo is a local name for a known species, the Humboldt squid. The giant Humboldt squid has got to be the most fascinating animal that I've ever encountered. Scott Cussell is a professional diver and cameraman with over 11,000 hours of clocked dive time. Experience has taught him to be wary of this predator. They are the most opportunistic predators in the Sea of Cortez, and they eat anything that they have the chance to. The largest known Humboldts weigh 200 plus pounds and reach lengths of about eight feet. But there is a theory that they get much bigger as big as a school bus, 50 feet or more. The goal of this Monster Quest expedition is to prove such a real-life sea monster exists by filming one for the first time. Roger Hanlon is senior scientist at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. He investigates the behavior of cephalopods and other marine life. I definitely believe the Humboldt is fully capable of attacking, quickly subduing, and eating a human being with little effort. The Humboldt's morphology helps explain why it thrives in the ocean's depths. Shaped like a torpedo, the Humboldt propels itself by ejecting water through a hyponome, a muscular funnel that acts as a powerful siphon, and by using two diamond-shaped fins. Using this method, it can travel amazingly fast underwater at speeds of up to 20 miles an hour. It uses this speed to chase food and evade predators between areas near the surface and the deeper waters below. They vertically migrate almost on a daily basis. They stay deep during the day, they come up shallow during the night. They're following food sources, they're evading predators. The first thing you notice about this eye is its extreme large size. And this imparts the ability to see objects very clearly, high visual acuity at a distance. Squid eyes are filled with a little known substance known as rhodopsin, or visual purple. And we know what the peak sensitivity of that rhodopsin pigment is. It's 492 nanometers. They see the world in shades of blue-green. 
This chemical may also explain why much bigger squids are seen so infrequently. They dwell in deeper waters. Even in the dark abyss, they can see any approaching threat long before other creatures might. And when presented with these threats, Humboldt squids respond in a unique way. Chromatophores in the squid's skin open and close to flash from red to white, possibly to signal danger. It communicates by sight by using its chromatophores. The chromatophores are linked directly to the brain with the biggest neurons in the animal kingdom. Imagine 50-foot predators with the ability to communicate and coordinate attacks. Their large brains suggest they have that capability. The Humboldt squid has got to be the most fascinating animal that I've ever encountered. But Scott Cassell knows firsthand that as fascinating as these creatures are, they are also dangerous. In 1996, in deep waters near the southern tip of Baja, Cassell encountered several five-foot Humboldt squid specimens. When the first one reached out to touch him, it led to an experience he likens to a mauling. Gets me right on the arm and pulls my arm back and gives it a good yank and pulls my shoulder right out of the socket. And as I was really shocked about what happened, I feel a couple more of them wrap onto my feet and they start to pull me down. And that's when I was like, oh, God. And so I start reaching up to clear my nose. And just as I was trying to clear my, you know, pinch my nose to clear my ears, another squid latches onto my thigh. And so I started to hit him and pull this arm off. And as I pulled this arm off, it kind of went back into its socket, but it wasn't any good. So I just held onto my camera as hard as I could, and I was beating this animal. Well, the other ones were dragging me down, and I felt my right eardrum just pierce in. <laughs> and it just imploded, so I ruptured my right eardrum, which if you've ever experienced that, is just instant vertigo. So now I'm extraordinarily dizzy. I have no idea which way is up other than watching my bubbles. At about 70 feet deep, Cassell is finally able to free himself from his attackers, but he now has another problem. And I'm looking up at the boat and my, I realize my mask has been flooded by one of the squid. And so now I'm clawing my way up to the surface, and I'm exhaling and exhaling, and I get to the surface, and the fisherman's like, I told you you were gonna get hurt. <laughs> Cassell is fortunate his attackers were only six foot long, small in comparison to the giants some experts believe live here. I believe that there could be large numbers of these monsters in the bottom of the Sea of Cortez. Doug Heichick is a wilderness television producer and inventor of specialized camera systems. Heichick says there is a reason the monster-sized squid have not been discovered. My theory is really based on nutrition. What I think happens is that the five, six, eight-foot Humboldt squid travel up and down the vertical water column, and on their way up, they're gathering nutrition by way of eating fish and other small game. They're then traveling and migrating down to the bottom once a day, and there, there are monsters waiting in lair for these smaller squid. Basically, they're cannibalizing their own kind, and I believe that these monsters never see the light of day. They never travel up, and when they die, their bodies basically decompose at the very deep depths. For years, Heichuk has designed and deployed innovative camera systems to capture firsts in nature photography. Every time I see footage from one of these camera systems, I always think, wow, I'm the first human for the first time to witness this. Can we do to add just to make it safe? To prove this theory, Cassell's team has been recruited for one of the most unique squid expeditions ever attempted. And that's pretty much what it's going to look like. For their mission to be a success, several different things must happen. First, the team will have to find a Humboldt squid pod. Then they'll need to attract a good specimen, big enough to carry the camera. Next, they'll need to fit the camera to the squid and hope that it dives down to deeper waters. To capture their Trojan squid, Cassell and Heichik have designed a custom lure named Pseudomorph, or Sue for short. This lure is hoped to be able to catch a squid while it's down there in the deep sea. 
2,500 miles away from the Sea of Cortez at Metro Molded in Minneapolis, the team is overseeing construction of the lure. The idea is for Sue to look like a small squid and a potential meal for a much larger squid. Wow, very cool. All we gotta do is get it down to Mexico. Mm. Customs gonna love that. If Hychik is right, his cameras will be the first to record a monster-sized Humboldt swimming freely in its natural habitat. Monster Quest is planning a deep water expedition to the Sea of Cortez for a squid as large as a school bus. There's always someone bigger, is something my mom told me. No matter how big and bad you are, there's always somebody that can take that title away from you. I filmed an eight foot Humboldt squid that was in excess of 200 pounds, and I do not think that he's the biggest. The existence of an outsized Humboldt with the attitude to match could lend some credence to an old legend. In the 12th century, Norwegian sailors first described a squid-like sea monster called the Kraken, after the word crake, which means something unhealthy or twisted. Legend has it that the Kraken created whirlpools large enough to sink ships, and that its tentacles were big enough to reach even the tallest masts. This image was drawn from the descriptions of French sailors who claimed to have been attacked by the Kraken off the Canary Islands in 1861. It suggests a creature some 36 feet long. It is one of the earliest sea monsters. Richard Ellis is a biologist and researcher at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. He says the Kraken's terrifying appeal for storytellers through the ages lies in its size and alleged appetite for carnage. There are a lot of stories, all of which turn out to be old sailors' tales about giant squid attacking ships or grabbing people off the decks or grabbing people offshore. Uh, none of these turn out to be true. Jules Verne was among the literary greats inspired by these stories. In 20,000 leagues under the sea, the crew of the Nautilus sustains a bloody attack by a herd of 25-foot giant squid. The book's protagonist describes one of the creatures this way. Enormous staring eyes, eight arms, like the serpentine hair of the Furies. The monster's mouth, a beak made of horn and shaped like that of a parrot. Among the first people to suspect that it could be a giant squid were whalers who worked in the southern oceans. The whalers in the 18th and 19th century, which were hunting sperm whales, would catch the sperm whales and harpoon them, and every once in a while, a harpooned sperm whale would regurgitate some strange object, which turned out to be often the arm or the body of a giant squid. The whalers would hook that, drag it ashore, and look at it, and they were probably the first people who methodically understood the existence of giant squid. Along with the stories of the Kraken's attack on ships, sailors told of battles between the monster and its nemesis, the sperm whale. Whether or not it really is able to fight well with a sperm whale is the big question because there have been the sucker marks found on the jaws and the skin around the mouth of a sperm whale, but most of us who know this animal and talk to our colleagues who know whale behavior, I'm pretty sure the whales are eating those squids, <laughs> and those are the last gasp <laughs> tries by the squid not to be swallowed. Some believe this old rivalry may explain the stories of squids attacking ships, the squid mistaking the vessels for a sperm whale but not Ellis. They're probably heavily elaborated, but there are some accounts of squid attacking people in rowboats. The people would row over to where they saw something on the surface, they would get close enough to it, and then the thing would start flailing around and they'd chop its arms off with an ax. Most of those stories are probably great exaggerations. Still, the Pangaros say it has happened in the Gulf of California. To succeed, the expedition to find a giant Humboldt will need to deploy a camera to an area they believe is the most likely habitat for a monster-sized Humboldt squid, the darkest depths of the Sea of Cortez. 
Dubbed the Project Trojan, the plan is a simple one. Attach a camera to a live squid and hope it will swim to where the much larger squid live, 1,000 feet below the surface. Hopefully he'll film the biggest squid that's ever been filmed. And I think we have a good chance, I really do. Hychuk hopes that a camera-equipped Trojan squid will then infiltrate monster-sized squid pods, something large, noisy submersibles have not been able to do. But this ambitious plan has its skeptics. When we heard Doug's plan to catch a squid, attach a camera to this squid, and catch another squid, I was ER. It won't work. Jeff Cernoff of Nature Vision Incorporated is supplying the team's underwater and motion-activated camera system. You know, this is a near mission impossible, but we know this crew, they've done great things in the past, so we're very hopeful that they might make this discovery. And we're still gonna be trying to get uh, squids on jigs so we can put the, the tag mounted camera on it, let it go, and hopefully see some really cool stuff. And any natural history filming we can get of the animals coming up. To find the squid pods, Cassell will recruit local fishermen and their boats as research vessels. A $1,000 bounty has been issued to any fisherman who locates an active pod of Humboldt's. One challenge is that, unlike other marine life, squid are difficult to find using sonar. The composition of the squid is basically the same as seawater. It's basically the same density as seawater, and they have no bones. Dale Pearson is a survival specialist and team expedition leader. He has been diving for over 20 years. So the only thing you're gonna get a radar bounce off of is their beak. So you're talking an eight-foot squid. Maybe has a beak, you know, that big. So it's gonna look like a fish this big. To assist, the team has recruited the services of Humminbird, a company that makes sonars, depth sounders, and GPS devices for professional and amateur fishermen alike. For this expedition, Humminbird's engineers have developed a sonar device that will help the team detect squid. What we can do to an individual sonar unit to help be able to spot the squids as targets is to max out that unit by increasing the transmit gain and the receiver sensitivity so that you have the best opportunity of spotting the squids. And finally, to attach the camera, divers Pearson and Cassell will have to be in the water with the squid. After his first brush with the knife sharp snapping beak of the Humboldt and the thousands of teeth inside its suction cups, Cassell began diving in self-designed chainmail armor. For this expedition, he wants something even stronger, a carbon fiber armor system even tougher than chainmail. He's enlisted the aid of Jeremiah Sullivan, a marine biologist and the inventor of the Neptunic shark suit. What's happening, man? Uh, I'm getting bit up by the squid and I need a little help on the armor. The problem is, is that the forearm areas. Yeah. A beak can actually encompass my whole forearm mm -hmm. and the bite pressure has actually caused damage to me. It can break my arm. Depending on what it is specifically you think that force might be, we can use the appropriate material for the job, keep it lightweight, make it as easy as possible for you to swim in it. One of the other problems that I'm having is that I'm filming the squid face on and they're attacking the camera and the camera in turn is hitting me in the chest. So I was wondering if there's any impact protection that we can develop. So you want to put an airbag in the chest? Yeah. The chest. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you come on in and we'll, we'll get some measurements and we'll get started. Sweet, thanks. thanks. Wing tip to wing tip, 20 inches. The suit will be constructed using a titanium composite material able to withstand the powerful bite pressure of the squid's beak. Well, Jeremiah, thank you very much, dude. Great awesome. I hope it works out. You managed to address all the concerns that I had, but you also made it beautiful. This thing looks incredible. Now, with all the pieces in place, the expedition is ready to launch. Within 24 hours, they'll find themselves floating above a spot teeming with prospective specimens for Project Trojan. Okay, both divers, be advised, Sue is going in the water. But no one could have prepared them for what will happen next. It just all unraveled. <laughs> In 
It's morning, the day before the expedition. The staging is at the Loretto Bay Marina and Hotel, just minutes away from where fishermen are catching Humboldt's squid in their nets. It is located on the east coast of the Sea of Cortez, about 100 miles north of Cabo San Lucas. This deep water channel could also hold another large squid, the Architeuthis, commonly called the giant squid. And it is indisputably huge. The giant squid, Architeuthis, and the Humboldt squid uh, are very different animals. Little is known about Architeuthis. What is known comes primarily from dead or dying specimens. Since the late 19th century, giant squid have sometimes become entangled in fishermen's nets or have washed ashore in New Zealand, Newfoundland, and Tasmania. The largest known squid was 57 feet long from the tip of its tail to the tip of its tentacles, and it washed ashore in the 1920s in New Zealand. At 60 feet, such an animal could equal the size of the seafaring vessels from centuries past. Columbus's Pinta, for example, was only 60 feet long. So could Architeuthis be the real Kraken? Richard Ellis doesn't think so. I think there's absolutely no truth to the stories of ships being attacked. But what of the stories of attacks on man? Stories of squids killing people are anecdotal at best. To date, there is not a known, authenticated report of a fatal squid attack on a human. It's legend perpetuated in fiction, not fact. Here, gentlemen, is your villa. No biologist has ever seen a giant squid Architeuthis alive, so we don't know what they really do. However, there have been several recent discoveries. In 2004, researchers from the National Science Museum of Japan Association hooked a 26-foot Architeuthis, 3,000 feet deep, off Japan's Ogasawara Islands, the first to snap pictures of a living animal. And in February of 2007, a New Zealand fishing vessel in Antarctica's Ross Sea hauled in the largest live squid ever caught a 33-foot, 1,000-pound species known as Mesonicuthis hamiltoni, or more commonly, a colossal squid, a giant comparable to Architeuthis. Mesonicuthis probably does not grow that long, but it's much, much heavier. The colossal squid's beak is the largest of any squid, and their eyes are the size of volleyballs. But it is the little Humboldt that has the nasty attitude much more like the Kraken legend. Pangaro fishermen have been catching Humboldt squid here for centuries. And while there is no proof of a monster-sized animal, they can attest to the creature's ferocity. In 1997, fisherman Liberto Arbos Rodriguez Cabo claims he was attacked by a Humboldt squid. Liberto was bringing his lure back to the boat after a long day of squid fishing. Little did he know, a Humboldt was in hot pursuit. Cuando metió la mano para jalarlo, este animal lo tomó y le abrió la piel. Él tomó el cuchillo. Once you have this animal slam onto you, what it can be a high rate of speed, then you get the chitinous ring teeth, suction cups grabbing onto you. But in the middle of all of those is this very large man-sized beak. Imagine a 100-pound carnivorous macaw parrot. And then its head can con continue to bite and bite and bite and bite and take chunks out of you. It'll actually subduct over the outside of it so that it cuts like two pair of big scissors. So it can bite onto you with incredible force. And in the next 24 hours, these two men and their crew are going to try to find a monster-sized Humboldt. First, however, they must test their gear. They want no surprises on the expedition itself. Yeah, copy that. So uh, topside uh, without microphone is clear. Uh, red divers, this is Red Diver. You're coming in a little bit scrambled on my headset. I think maybe 
my earpiece is turned up too loud, or... Okay, second check, how's that? Yeah, that's a little bit better right there, that's better. You guys got a clear mask? What we're trying to accomplish this first day is to just pre-check all the systems exactly like we're going to be diving them, pre-dive them in the pool, make sure everything's fine. We had some little glitches, which is why we always do this. We, they're all fixed up, so everything's to go. Leah, I'm concerned about the storm. Can you tell me what the forecast is? This expedition is ready to launch, but news of an approaching hurricane has the crew on edge. Well, tomorrow we should start feeling the effects of it. We'll have some thunderstorms tomorrow, probably, and noon our time, it was 300 miles southeast of Cabo, and it's moving northwest. The hurricane itself has actually been pushing down on the water in the high pressure areas, and in the center of the eye, it's been pulling water up. The hurricane is expected to hit the Sea of Cortez in the next 24 hours. Nervous but undeterred, the crew heads out to their location. Man, well, Eric. Okay, very good, you? The team is made up of Dale Pearson, Shauna Meyer, Robert Landereth, Eric Hextall, and Keith Lindquist. Each is an expert diver, and each will have a specific responsibility, ranging from jigging the squid lure to recording underwater audio and video. The first objective is to capture a live squid. This lure, known as Sue, has hundreds of pins that will entangle a decent-sized Humboldt without harming it. Is that thing ready to drop? Yes. Scott wants it in his hands. Okay, go. Jigs in the water. So far, the team's efforts have yielded disappointing results. Let loose the line. But then, a break. Off to the right, which is them over there, and that's squid. Okay, both divers, be advised, Sue is going in the water. If Sue the lure can entangle a likely prospect, the team must haul it up from the depths without hurting it, a process which can take hours, and time is running out. Both divers, be advised, we only have about 15 more minutes of light. Did they get some good shots yeah. of it? Uh, did you get some good shots of it, Scott? Okay. The approaching hurricane is producing drastic changes in air pressure, causing the ocean around them to toss and churn violently. Oh, oh it just all unraveled. I couldn't keep it together. The divers are becoming sick below the surface and are in danger of vomiting and suffocating in their masks. Pearson makes it to the surface exhausted and becomes entangled in the communications cables. So now I'm stuck to the boat, so I'm pitching. So it's just shaking me around like a rag dog. 
I look at him straight in his eyes. He sees what's up. He sees that I'm calm enough to, to, that he can not worry. He cuts me loose. Okay, you're gonna lose comms. Roger. Between my equilibrium shot to my ear and the pitchiness of the boat, I unraveled. Scott Cassell, Dale Pearson, and their expedition team have returned to the Sea of Cortez, about 11 miles from Loreto Bay, Mexico, in search for a monster-sized Humboldt squid. Yes. Here now. We've got that. Okay, and who's here? Right there? Okay. The Humboldt squid lives in the Humboldt Current, a large marine ecosystem that contains cold, low salinity waters that flow along the eastern Pacific Ocean from the tip of South America to Alaska. Yesterday, their efforts were thwarted by rough seas and the elusiveness of their prey. Oh yeah, we'll pull it off, but you know what I mean? You're not gonna crack a home run the first time you step up to the plate. We're gonna need a few pitches, you know? For their protection against these dangerous animals, the divers are wearing 100-pound armor-clad dive suits. In the 90-degree heat, they become cast iron ovens. On the job air conditioning system, a little bit of cold water on your brains. Always works good. They are also working against the clock. The heat is a harbinger of nastier weather to come. The hurricane is getting closer. As the minutes tick away, a fisherman finally catches a squid. He's down about 600 feet. This one is too small to bear the weight of the one and a half pound camera, but it gives the team hope that they are in the right area. They start really freaking out. They do not like being in the top 20 feet of the water column. On top of that, you start swimming over by one. He's hooked on a jig. He's in the top 15, 20, 30 feet of the water column. And then you get this big black predator swimming over to him and the first thing he does is just lose his mind and try to get away, shoot ink everywhere and take off. Once again, the team releases Sue, dropping it hundreds of feet into the depths. The lure is jigged up and down slowly in hopes of inviting an attack by a squid large enough to carry the weight of the Trojan camera system. Keith Lindquist is in charge of operating Sue and recording any underwater attack on the lure. Got it. He will manage the 1,500-foot-long spool of thin Kevlar cord video cable. It can withstand pulls of 600 pounds or more by a fighting squid, something Keith doesn't want to deal with. Look at this footage. Look at this footage. It's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. At 700 feet, Sue does the job. A squid becomes entangled on the lure's barbless pins. We got one on. Tell him we got one on. Now, a slow battle is underway to gently bring the squid within reach of the divers so they can install the miniature camera and light system. It must remain strong and unharmed or it could be attacked by other squid who will cannibalize it before it can reach the real monsters that roam much deeper. This one is a perfect specimen, five to six feet long and weighing approximately 200 pounds. Okay, you ready? I'm coming to the camera. Oh, sorry. 
The divers are grateful for their armor suits. The angry animal lashes at them with its sharp teeth-lined tentacles. It even bites Cassell with its beak. Now Pearson and Cassell must attach the camera and light system. But before the mount is complete, the squid fills the water with ink, a defensive behavior that makes it difficult to attach the equipment. The camera is mounted with small anchors fitted onto the squid fin. Breakaway pins will allow the system to release the anchors to protect the squid from harm. Get ready, get ready, put this up on the seat Copy there. Copy that, congratulations. Put it right up there, yep. Look at the size of that thing. Okay, Are you ready? Are you ready? Yep, it's going. We're go, we're go. With any luck, the Trojan squid will dive down to the murkier depths, where the team suspect huge versions of its brethren are lurking. Here it goes, get a line, get a line. Give him some line. Where's the line? Okay, he's gonna go, bud. We're going, what? Make sure it's recording, that's your it's only recording. job. Recording. No. It's recording. Uh, no, no, down. It's very exciting to think about it. First time in history, we got a camera on a squid that's pretty clear. You didn't hear me right. Oh, it's dark. Hold on, I'm switching the lights out. What is it the now, Steve? Wait. The video cable is spooling out at an incredible rate. The team watches as deep below, the Trojan squid's companions investigate the camera. Repeatedly, they bite the rubber enclosure. Their behavior seems to reveal a level of intelligence and curiosity often only attributed to mammals. It has been just over an hour since the Trojan squid was released and swam straight down. With nearly 1,000 feet of cable reeled out, and at the end of its tether, the camera is right where the team had hoped. Suddenly, the camera reveals that the Trojan squid has begun to flash colors, red to white to red again, possibly signaling danger. On the surface, the crew is no longer able to monitor the video due to the heavy sea. The tropical storm is now only 50 miles away. Time has run out for the expedition. They have to gently reel in the Trojan squid to remove the camera, a process that could take hours. We have to be off the water in four hours. We got four hours before we gotta get the hell out of here. With the tropical storm minutes away and heading towards them, the team finally brings the Trojan squid to the surface detaches the camera system and releases the animal. Minutes later, they are safely ashore in Cabo, Mexico. Dale, Pearson, and Cassell regroup with the team. Everyone is eager to see the footage obtained by the Trojan squid. I think this is it. Will they finally have visual photographic evidence of what they have long suspected, a giant ferocious Humboldt squid the model for the Kraken? Oh, that was a big one. <laughs> that was one. a big squid. <laughs> Did you oh, see that? Oh. oh. So that thing attacked the camera, even though it was hooked to a squid. Right. He didn't attack the squid, he attacked the camera on the squid. Right. And he didn't even really bite it. It's like he was feeling it to see what it was hooked to his buddy. Then out of the darkness. Whoa. Oh. At 1,000 feet. <laughs> an apparition. Although it's difficult to tell, this squid appears to be enormous. Is it a giant squid, a colossal squid, or is it the extra large Humboldt they were looking for? Because of the size of that squid and the, how much it shocked him is that, is it possible that that was an Architeuthis? Because the camera's a thousand feet deep. 
Is that possible that was an Architeuthis making an attempted strike on our Decidicus gigas, a camera squid? You know what? That's, that's a question I can't answer right now. Wow. Two days later, back in Minnesota, Hychek sees the footage for the first time. That is a massive animal. When you play the footage full speed, you can see the huge suckers that are about the size of coffee cup lids I get in the morning. And also, if I'm going by the eye reflection, the beak would be somewhere in here. I mean, this is a huge distance. And so, based on that and what I know, I mean, this animal's fins would be way back here. I mean, be way off the monitor. I'm very, very interested in what Roger Hanlon would have to say from the Marine Biology Lab on what species. I mean, I just, I can't comprehend this as a Humboldt. Even I can't. I mean, it's just absolutely massive. First impressions, gut reaction, it's big. In terms of distinguishing it as a Humboldt or something else, that's a lot more difficult. The video does not provide enough detail for Hanlon to be able to discern the species, but it may still be possible to estimate its size. Peter Schmitz is a video analysis expert with motion engineering, specializing in video forensics. What we're trying to do is determine the distance the target is from the camera. And by doing that, it gives us a, 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 another avenue to help determine the size of the target. Peter has the camera and light system specifications from the manufacturer, including the details of its performance in salt water. First thing I'm going to do is put in the sensor information uh, as to the resolution of the sensor. Um, this will help me determine the area that we're going to be looking at. Um, I also have to put in the lens information, which in this case happened to be a 3.2 millimeter lens, which and quite frankly is going to make things that are at a distance look much smaller than they really are. Using light throw and depth of field data, Peter should be able to calculate the distance between the animal's beak and its eye, the last visible part of the squid's body within range of the light. What I'm doing is I'm setting up the system to measure based on the creature's arms and the reflective eye. And based on the information measuring from that reflector to the creature's mouth, which should be right in the middle of the arms here, we can get a close estimate on how big this creature really is. Another way to determine the overall size of the monster is to determine the arm diameter. The arms are over a foot and a half in diameter. This thing has some monster arms coming out of this. With this data, biologists can use known squid dimensions to create a comparative estimate. The first calculation uses Humboldt squid proportions. Based on this measurement, it could be upwards of 60 feet in length. This 60-foot estimate makes this beast almost 10 times larger than the largest known Humboldt squid, making it the largest squid of any species ever recorded. But if the animal here is Architeuthis, or giant squid, the monster is much larger. The morphology of Architeuthis and Humboldt are very similar, with one big exception. The Architeuthis squid's tentacles are three times longer. Schmitz estimates an overall length of 108 feet, roughly twice the size of the largest known Architeuthis, and the same size as the largest known animal alive today, the blue whale. These estimates have impressed even the expedition team. I have to admit, I was completely shocked by the final results of how big the squid that we filmed really was. It's always fun to me when you take people and high technology and you throw them in the sea and give them a mission to perform and see what comes out of it. Did this beast inspire the Kraken? History supports, at the very least, the possibility. And now this piece of visual evidence indicates that there is still much to learn about what lurks in the sea's depths. I have a great regret that we were cut short by the weather, the hurricane that happened. Uh, definitely gives us another reason to go back. So I'm hoping on the next expedition we can continue to make more discoveries. All I ask is that people look at the images that we collect and leave this with a childlike wonder about the sea and its secrets.